Hey brothers and sisters of the crib, we're back in again with another reaction video. Today we're going to react to some Path of Exile 2 endgame content reveal. The one hour long content reveal roadmap. Well, I guess it's kind of a roadmap because it's more in a sense that they're going to be um, some of the early access content that's going to come out for the this December 6th. But uh, there's going to be even more content added to it. But regardless, I'm very excited because this is definitely what, you know, Diablo 4 should have been. But no more Diablo talk. Let's talk POE. Anyways, let's see what Jonathan Rogers has to say to us. Jonathan Rogers, Game Director on Path of Exile 2. Now, Path of Exile 2 is going into early access in around two weeks on December the 6th. But even though it's early access, this isn't just some small taste. The game is huge. In this live stream, we're going to be introducing everything you can expect. So without further ado, let's roll the gameplay trailer. Existence is a thing of beauty. Precious, but impermanent. Life and death are mortal enemies and yet bound to one another. The continuation of life must be protected at all costs. Some have said, my methods are brutal. To this I say, there can be no salvation without sacrifice. We are faced with the end, and I will do what I must. Those who obsess with death, let them soon be acquainted with it. Now as you just saw, even in early access, Path of Exile 2 is a big game. It's actually been five years since we announced PoE 2, and over that time we've revealed a lot, but it's been in bits and pieces. It's pretty hard to keep track of it all. So today we're going to do a full rundown of all the content that will be available at the start of Early Access. Classes, character progression systems, and for the first time, a full overview of the end game. This is going to be a big one, so get comfortable. For 20 years, Rayclast has been free from any sources of corruption. But the Count of Ogham, tempted by promises of power, intends to harness it once more. The dead are rising, monsters are mutating, and madness is spreading. Under the dark influence of corruption, the Count doles out sentences of death to any who would question him. And this is where you find yourself at the start of POE 2. Explore the dark forests of Ogham. Traverse the barren plains of the Vasteri Desert and delve into the jungle ruins of Utsal, an ancient Val city. There are challenging monsters, hidden runes, lost camps and treasures, 
roaming merchants, and of course, unique bosses. No two areas are the same. It falls to you to track down the seed of corruption, the source of all this devastation. On the way, you'll face fearsome monsters, meet strange characters, forge unlikely bonds, and uncover lost civilizations. But first, you'll need to pick a class. Now, Early Access will initially have six classes available. Let's have a look at them. The Monk is a fast and furious melee fighter. He dashes in and out of combat and has mechanics that involve building up and keeping momentum. Like all classes in PoE2, you'll want to use a wide variety of skills to mix and match different combos. To get new skills, you will first need to find skill gems. Using a skill gem will open the gem cutting menu, which shows all the active skills available in PoE2. You can choose an existing skill to level up, or choose to engrave a new one. Since this is a level 7 skill gem, even if you pick a new skill, it will immediately be level 7, so there's no harm in trying out something new. The monk primarily uses the quarterstaff. There are three schools of martial arts, lightning, ice, and wind. But don't think you have to stick to just one. The best combos are going to involve mixing elements of all three. Let's try killing palm. Like many monk skills, this can be used to quickly take advantage of a specific situation. If there's an enemy on low life, you can use Killing Palm to dash to them and kill them instantly. This will provide a power charge. Then we can use a different skill to consume that power charge for a much more devastating attack. The Monk also has powerful combo skills. Tempest Bell, for example, is a skill that places a giant resonating bell. Hitting the bell causes it to ring, dealing damage to all enemies around it. You can also do things like freeze or shock the bell, which will add elemental damage to the strikes. The monk also has a variety of abilities to empower his staff. If an enemy is close to being stunned, you can use Staggering Palm to punch them down. After that, any attack you do will shoot out wind projectiles. There are 21 active skills for quarter staves, so this just scratches the surface of the options that you have. By end game, you'll be dashing from pack to pack, spewing projectiles and obliterating screens of enemies with huge combo attacks. Now if you like a style of melee that's a little slower, but hits much harder, then the warrior is for you. He pounds the ground with big chunky attacks and can shrug off the hits of small enemies with large amounts of armor. Even though the mace slams are slow, you never lose control. Longer attacks can be retargeted as you go, and if you find yourself committed to a long attack, you can dodge roll out of it at any time. Among the skill option for maces, you will find a variety of slams, fire attacks, war cries, and shield skills. Here, I'm going to slam the ground, rending it apart with lines of fire. Any slam skill will then cause these fissures to erupt with lava. I can even run through them with a skill like Stampede to do huge amounts of damage. The warrior can also use War Cries, which can empower your next skill. Seismic Cry, for example, will double any slams from the next attack. The Stampede counts as a slam, so I can double that for even more craziness. If you want to go a little faster and be a little more defensive, equip a shield. In PoE 2, you can raise your shield at any time to block all damage from the front, even spells. While holding up your shield, your stun meter will build as you take damage, so be careful. If it reaches 100%, your stance will break and you will be vulnerable. Some enemies also have unblockable attacks, which are indicated by this red flash. If you see one of these coming, make sure to dodge out of the way. Using a shield also gives you access to shield skills, like Shield Charge which allows you to charge towards enemies and stun them. While charging, you're also blocking the whole time, so you have full damage immunity from the front. The warrior also has access to totems. Some totems have built-in abilities, like Shockwave Totem, which can be placed to stun nearby enemies and trigger aftershocks like those from the Earthquake. But you can also get Ancestral Warrior Totems, which allow you to use any slam skill in your repertoire. This is a meta skill, which means that it's a skill you can put other skills into. I can take a slam like Sunder and socket it into my Ancestral Warrior Totem. Now when I summon him, he'll sit there and slam the monsters from a distance. There are 20 active skills for maces, so there's a lot more to try out. But by endgame, you're going to be dropping hammers from the sky, leaping fearlessly into combat and separating the very earth you stand on. Time for some ranged attacks. The Ranger is primarily about the bow, but we wanted to make sure that she feels agile as well. In PoE 2, you can shoot while moving. 
Combined with all the skills the Ranger has that allow you to jump around, you will have a lot of mobility in combat. Bow skills have a variety of lightning, poison, ice and physical attacks. Lightning attacks bounce around between targets. You can also stick lightning arrows in the ground which explode when hit by the bounces, or electrocute enemies to take them out of combat. Ice attacks allow you to slow and freeze enemies to keep them away from you. Using poison, not only can you slowly damage your enemies from afar, but also grow some interesting plants. With 21 bow skills and all the mobility and combo tools the Ranger has, you can take advantage of every situation. By endgame, you'll be creating hundreds of arrows, be they falling from the sky, bouncing around between enemies, or spraying out of tornadoes. You might have noticed in the bottom left of the screen that the flask slots look a little different. In Peewee 2, you have one dedicated life flask slot and one mana flask slot. Flasks gain charges as you kill enemies, and typically allow you to heal six or seven times if they're full. But that's not the only thing you can use charges for. Charms are a new item type that will automatically defend you from various debuffs or damage types. Having trouble with getting frozen? Equip a thawing charm. When it's fully charged, it will make you immune to freeze for three seconds if you get frozen. To recharge them, just kill more monsters. You can gain more slots for charms by upgrading your belt. The mercenary wields a crossbow that can be loaded with different ammo types, offering versatility, power and mobility. All classes in Path of Exile 2 can be controlled with WASD, which makes this class play exactly like a shooter. For the crossbow, you will find skills that work like shotguns, sniper rifles, assault rifles, and even grenade launchers. But not only that, there are a wide variety of more interesting elemental ammos too. It's very fast to switch between ammo types, as long as you already have them loaded, which makes the mercenary able to combo abilities together for devastating effect. Use Glacial Bolt to create walls of ice to separate enemies, then switch to Fragmentation Rounds to explode the ice, dealing massive AoE damage. If I come across an armoured enemy, I could use Armour Piercing Rounds to break their armour, and then High Velocity Rounds to take them down. Or perhaps I could fire a gas grenade to poison enemies, before detonating the cloud with an explosive shot for massive damage. If you want to call in some suppressing fire, you can summon artillery ballistas. These have a minimum range, so you'll want to prepare your position carefully before moving in. There are 22 active skills for crossbows. By endgame, you'll be calling destruction down from the sky as you litter the battlefield with grenades and pepper your enemies with your automatic shotgun. If you're looking to take a back seat and let your minions do the work, then the witch should be your choice. She can call forth hordes of undead monsters to fight for her while casting powerful chaos spells that debilitate her enemies. Occult skills are some of the most varied in the game, with skeletons, noxious spells, specialty minions, curses and sacrificial magic. Before we talk about minions, we'll have to talk about a new resource in Path of Exile 2 called Spirit. This is a spirit gem, which allows you to pick from a range of persistent skills. All classes have a variety of these skills which can add some very interesting effects, like Arctic Armor which does cold damage to enemies that hit you, or Raging Spirits which summon fiery skulls each time you cast a fire spell. For the Witch though, we'll want to be using our spirit to create permanent minions. These minions will be revived automatically when they die, so you don't have to worry about resummoning them all the time. Here I'm using the skill screen to allocate which minions I would like in my horde. You can see the spirit cost of each one. Skeletal warriors are cheap, but weak. Useful for tanking damage and distracting enemies. But I want more heavy hitters in my army, so I'm going to unsummon some warriors and instead add skeletal arsonists. Permanent minions come with special active abilities called command skills. You can order these guys to detonate your own minions for even more damage and area of effect. If you want a bigger army, you'll need a scepter. This new weapon type is imbued with even more spirit, allowing you to summon even more friends. And if you want an even bigger army than that, you can take advantage of corpses to summon true hordes of minions. But what can a witch do while her army is at work? Well, she has a range of chaos spells to spread disease amongst your enemies, or bone skills to impale them. Or, you know, you could curse them to make them weaker so your horde can take them down. There are 25 active occult skills. By the end game, you will be the leader of a fearsome army of the dead, consuming everything in its path. The sorceress bends the elements to her will, using them to unleash devastation on her foes. This classic spellcaster weaves a flurry of elemental magic from afar. 
the elemental skills have everything you might expect and more. Fireballs, icy explosions, lightning storms, you get the idea. Each spell is unique and has many different ways to build and combo with others, even between different elements. For example, Flame Wall conjures a burning line that not only damages enemies, but also empowers all projectiles that pass through it. If you place a wall and fire lightning sparks through it, they'll gain extra fire damage. It's a good idea to take advantage of the ability to automatically swap weapons when you use certain skills. Having a special staff with bonuses to fire skills and another with bonuses to lightning skills can really power up a combo like this. The Sorceress can also take advantage of powerful trigger gems. For example, you could grab the Cast and Ignite gem and use it with Firestorm. As you ignite enemies, a counter will go up in the top left corner. When it's full, a Firestorm will automatically be cast at the enemy that was ignited. There are 25 active elemental skills. By endgame, you'll be firing off projectiles left and right as you rain down elemental storms on your foes. Now, those are the characters that will be available at the start of Early Access, but we will be adding six more character classes with just as many skills and options as these. There's a lot more to come. There's one more important thing to mention about skills. Even though we talk about them as belong to each class, in reality, there are no restrictions. You can use all these skills on any class so long as you have the attributes. For example, a Poison Ranger might want to try out using Occult Curses to increase her poison damage. Or a Monk might want to trigger Elemental Ice Walls to use with his Glacial Cascade combo. The possibilities for cross-class combos are practically unlimited. We're looking forward to what kind of things you guys might find. Now, Path of Exile is a game known for build customization, and we haven't even scratched the surface of what is possible yet. So let's talk about support gems. Path of Exile 2 has a system of support gems that can be combined with your active skills to dramatically change the way they work. If you find a support gem, then right-clicking it will open up this screen. Here you will find a variety of recommended support gems for each of your skills that you can pick between. For example, this is a multiple projectiles support gem and can be used to add multiple projectiles to any skill. Normally, when you fire a grenade, it'll look like this. But if we add multiple projectiles, then you get three of them. Once you have the gem, you can also freely move it between any of the skills in your character. If you want to have a multi-shot sniper rifle instead, then simply move the gem over to your high velocity round skill. Generally speaking, if it sounds like a support gem should work with a skill, then it will work. So it's a good idea to experiment. Note that you can only have one of each support gem on your character, so you'll want to think carefully about which supports can be used best with each skill for maximum damage. Now, if you want to stick to the recommendations, you should have a perfectly good time. But if you want to experiment a bit more, then uncheck that recommended button and you can see the full list of supports that will work with your skill. There are hundreds of support gems to choose from, and even we don't know the results of all the possible ways these can interact. Each skill can have up to five supports socketed into it. And if you're clever, you can come up with some pretty interesting ideas. Now, all of this is just scratching the surface. You can make frost vortexes, break people's armor, make minions explode, make skills repeat, make enemies set each other on fire, cull enemies or pin them to the ground. Supports let you drastically change the behavior of your skills and create your own unique build, or at least follow someone's OP build guide. So, speaking of builds, let's talk about one of the most iconic Path of Exile systems, the passive skill tree. Yes, it's huge. There are over 1,500 nodes on there. Now a lot of people open the tree and can get a little intimidated at first, but try not to be scared. There are lots of options, but at its core, it's pretty simple. Each level you get one point to put into the tree. Each class starts at a different location, but they all share the same tree. Around your section of the tree, you'll find relevant bonuses for your character. You should be safe in the knowledge that there aren't many wrong choices here. Almost all the starting nodes will be useful for your character in some way. But if you do happen to make a choice you regret, you'll be able to respec any nodes you've taken by spending a little bit of gold. Now, the tree is generally divided up into clusters which have similar themes. In each cluster you will find small nodes that give simple bonuses like increased damage, but the real power comes from notables. Notables normally have much more interesting bonuses, and they tend to care a lot more about how your build works and what skills you're using. For example, in the mercenary area of the tree, this one gives a 25% chance for crossbow skills to not consume a bolt. And here's one that gives grenades a chance to blow up a second time. This one gives a chance for projectiles to rebound off terrain, 
as well as giving you some pierce chance to make that more likely. Note that even though this is in the mercenary section, this would work with projectiles from all classes, so there are often reasons to go to different areas of the tree. In order to get between these clusters, you will generally have to allocate nodes in the attribute highways. Attribute nodes allow you to pick which attribute you would like to use, so it's very easy to get points for any attribute that your gear might need. You can change which attribute these nodes give you for half price at the respec vendor. In addition to notables, you will also find even larger passives called keystones. Keystones have both an upside and a downside, and often require changing your entire build to design around them. A great example is Giant's Blood, which allows you to wield two hand weapons in a single hand, but doubles the attribute requirements of them. You can use a two hand mace with a shield, or even dual wield them. How about Mind Over Matter, which makes all damage go to your mana pool first before your life pool, but you lose 50% of your mana regen. Skills like these can be tough to build around, but if you're up for the challenge, they can be very rewarding. As we showed you earlier on the Sorceress, you can swap between weapon sets on the fly as you use certain skills. One of the new features in Path of Exile 2's passive tree is that you can choose to have your passive tree change as you switch between weapon sets to take advantage of specific bonuses on the tree. For the Sorceress, you might want to change between Fire and Lightning specialization. Or you could switch between one hand and a two hand setup in order to be able to block boss attacks while following up with heavy hits from your bigger mace. Or perhaps you could have a full curse setup on your Witch to debuff enemies before switching to a Chaos degen build for maximum damage. If you want to stick with just one weapon set, you can just use these specialization points as bonus points to invest however you like but creative players will find plenty of opportunities with this system. You can get weapon specialization points throughout the campaign from optional bosses and quests. For example, if I manage to defeat the Crowbell, I'll get a weapon specialization book. There are lots of other permanent boosts available from the campaign too. On the map you can see icons that indicate the many optional encounters you can find. Some of them have permanent character boosts, and others have powerful items. If you're having trouble getting past a boss, it might be a good idea to explore and see what you can find. For example, if you defeat Blackjaw the Remnant, you'll gain a permanent increase to fire resistance. One of the most important finds are spirit bonuses. You can find the first one here in the canopy in Act 1. Defeat the boss in this area to acquire a permanent addition of spirit. The permanent buffs you gain from spirit are very powerful, and every class will find a use for them so make sure you hunt down these upgrades. There's one in each act. Now we haven't even talked about the most important element of character progression, items. That's why we're all here, right? Items in Path of Exile can be broken down into four rarity groups. Normal, Magic, Rare and Unique. One of the things you're going to want to do as you play through the campaign is upgrade the items you find, and you can do that with currency items. An Orb of Transmutation will allow you to upgrade a normal item to a magic item with one mod. You can then apply an Orb of Augmentation to add a second mod, then use a Regal Orb to add a third mod, and upgrade it to a Rare. Finally, you can use some Exalted Orbs to add more mods to your Rare to a total of 6 mods. One of the things we think is really important is to make these options available to use as you play. All the items that add mods are much more common than they were in Path of Exile 1, so that you can use them throughout your campaign playthrough. We want you to find things on the ground that can be crafted into upgrades much more frequently. As well as making the drop rates on these items much more common, you can also get them by disenchanting unwanted gear at the magic item vendor. If you disenchant magic items, you can build up to an orb of transmutation, and by disenchanting rares, you can build up to regal orbs. Another important area of crafting items in PoE2 is sockets. Some items you find will have sockets that can have Ezemite runes placed in them that add more mods to the item. If I insert this glacial rune into my helmet, it will give extra cold resistance. This is a great way to solve problems that you have with your build, like resistances or damage. If you find socketed items that you don't have a use for, you can take them to the salvage bench in town to work towards an artificer's orb. This will allow you to add sockets to your existing items. Body armors and two-hand weapons can have up to two sockets, while the rest of your armor and one-hand weapons can only have one socket. You can also salvage items with quality to create items like armor scraps or whetstones. These will allow you to increase the quality of your items for an up to 20% boost. If you don't want to disenchant or salvage your items, you can always sell them for gold. 
Gold can be used to buy items from vendors, and we've tried to do a lot to make sure that the items they have for sale are actually useful. Every time you level up, they get more stock, so make sure to check back often. Other vendors offer a gamble. Pay a flat amount of gold and you'll get a random item of a specific type. This could be a great way to improve your gear, if you're lucky. Gold is also used to respec your passive skills. Take advantage of this system to experiment with your tree and rework it as required. The other thing you might want to use gold for is the currency exchange. This allows you to exchange currency items with other players on an open market, in exchange for a small gold fee. Now all items in Path of Exile are freely tradable. We never bind anything to your character, except gold. Now most gear in Path of Exile 2 is randomly generated, but there's another type that isn't. Uniques. They are especially rare, each with a handcrafted set of unusual mods which can dramatically change a character's build. They're not just better rare items, they can do much stranger things that can fundamentally change your character. Corpse Wade will make any corpses you run through explode into clouds of poison. The Sands of Silk is a body armor that changes your dodge roll into a blink, morphing you into sand as you teleport past your foes. And of course some uniques are just pure hits of dopamine, like Quill Rain, which just turns your bow attacks into full auto by doubling your attack speed. Each unique is something that you can build your character around. We try to make sure that most unique items have a potential use at endgame, even if you find them early on. And as you can see, every single unique item comes with custom art to match. The last character progression system that you can do during the campaign is Ascension. Starting in Act 2, you will come across Ascension Trials, tests that you must complete to unlock your Ascension class. We'll explain these trials soon, but first let's take a look at what Ascending can do for your character. Each class has access to three Ascendancy classes, but at the start of Early Access, only two per class will be available. Ascendancy classes are unique to each character class, so choose wisely. They can drastically affect how you build your character. As a Sorceress, you could become a Storm Weaver, a Master of the Elements. Tempest Caller causes elemental storms to be summoned each time you do a critical hit with a spell. With Strike Twice, you can stack two copies of Shock for more damage, and going deeper into the tree, you can make all your damage types apply Shock. Make a Shock build from any skill. Alternatively, you could become a Chronomancer and command Time itself. She literally has the ability to stop time with Time Freeze. Not only that, but she has many other time manipulation abilities. Using Temporal Rift, she can teleport back to a previous location, resetting her life and mana back to what it was. Or with Time Snap, she can reset all her cooldowns and cast all her spells again. On the Warrior, you can choose between the Warbringer or the Titan. The Warbringer channels the might of his ancestors to gain tremendous power. Using Answered Call, you can summon ancestral spirits linked to each of your totems. With Jade Heritage, you can encase your body in a protective layer that absorbs all damage until it breaks. Warcaller's Bellow allows you to explode the corpses of your enemies. And with Great Wolf's Howl, you can ignore the cooldowns of your war cries. Let all that anger out. The Titan class is all about hitting big. With Earthbreaker, every slam is a chance to create an aftershock. With Crushing Impacts, every hit becomes a crushing blow, which will allow you to stun your enemies with ease. With Surprising Strength, you can take advantage of stunned enemies steal 40% more damage. As a Ranger, you might choose to be a Deadeye, an expert markswoman who can take down foes with style. With Endless Munitions, every attack gains an extra projectile. With Gathering Winds, she gains a small increase to movement speed with every attack. But be careful, she loses them when getting hit. With Eagle Eyes, she will never miss, allowing you to stop wasting all those passive points on accuracy. Alternatively, you could become a Pathfinder, the master of flasks and poison. She can choose from one of several throwable concoctions, allowing her to spend her flask charges to throw explosive bottles that deal various types of damage. A bleeding concoction will make your enemies bleed, while a fulminating one can shock your enemies, allowing you to do extra damage. Contagious Contamination allows her to spread poisons between her foes, while Overwhelming Toxicity doubles the number of stacks they can be infected by. Running Assault allows her to move much more quickly while firing, while Relentless Pursuit makes her totally immune to being slowed by enemies. The Witch can ascend into the Infernalist or the Blood Mage. 
As an infernalist, she can summon a loyal hellhound companion. The hellhound sets enemies on fire, as well as taking a percentage of the damage if the infernalist gets hit. With Pyromantic Pact, you can turn your mana into Infernal Flame. As you cast more spells, the flame builds up, and if it overflows, you'll take damage. Using Bringer of Flame, you'll want to make sure you keep the flames topped up. While your Infernal Flame is above 30%, all damage from you and your minions will ignite enemies. She can also transform into a literal demon. While in demon form, she takes an increasing amount of damage, but her cast speed and damage increase rapidly as well. So if you're planning on transforming into a demon, make sure you stack a lot of life recovery. She can also become a blood mage, a master of life and energy. All blood mages must pay the price of making skills cost life as well as mana, but in exchange, every monster they kill will drop life remnants, which allow them to quickly gain back that life. With Crimson Power, she can gain large amounts of extra life, and with Vitality Siphon, she can use her spells to leech life back as well. Once you've got a significant amount of life, you can use Gore Spike to make your critical hits deal incredible amounts of damage. A monk who is in tune with the elements might become an Invoker. With Elemental Expression, the Invoker will create waves of elemental power each time he does a critical strike. With Faith as a choice, you gain the ability to meditate, allowing you to double your energy shield. Choose between I am the blizzard or I am the thunder to specialize in cold or lightning. And I shall rage will allow you to turn into an unbound avatar. Each time you apply a status ailment to an enemy, you gain unbound fury. When you have enough, transform into an avatar to deal way more damage and inflict even more elemental ailments. Some monks choose to reach into the darkness instead. The acolyte of Chayula can exchange their mastery of spirit for darkness a resource that can be utilized to both absorb and deal damage. The Shroud of Darkness will protect you from all damage incoming, but if you take Grasp of the Void, you will deal extra chaos damage from all the darkness you have. Their Dark Pact offers greatly increased resistances to chaos damage and can allow their mana leech to not only happen instantly, but apply to their energy shield as well. Another node you can take is Waking Dream, which allows you to see into the domain of the Breach Demons. There you will see the flames of Chiyula that can be taken to gain life, mana, and damage. The mercenary has a job to do, but which job suits you? You might choose to become a witch hunter. Obsessive rituals will give you a sorcery ward, allowing you to defend yourself against elemental hits in exchange for less defense against attacks. With Zealous Inquisition, your enemies have a 10% chance to explode on death. The chance is doubled against demons and undead. With Judge, Jury and Executioner, your initial hit against enemies can deal up to 30% of their life and damage, if you're lucky. This is great for hunting powerful bosses. And with Witchbane, you can break your enemies' concentration, preventing them from casting spells as often as they would usually do. You could also choose to become a Gemling Legionnaire, enhancing your abilities by embedding gems directly in your flesh. Integrated Efficiency will give you extra skill slots. Thermatological Infusion gives you extra maximum resistances as you sock up more and more support gems. Adaptive Capability allows you to use any color of gem without worrying about attributes, while Crystalline Potential adds extra quality bonuses to every gem socketed into your character. So those are the Ascendancy classes for the start of Early Access, but one thing we haven't talked about yet is how you ascend in the first place. Ascension in Path of Exile 2 requires completion of one of the Great Trials, which you'll find as you progress through the campaign. Each one is associated with one of the major cultures of Rayclast. Located in the Vasteri Plains are the Maraketh, a culture of rich tales and brutal traditions, who must do whatever it takes to survive in the desert. The highest position in Maraketh culture is a Sekima, and it is not a title given freely. All aspirants must complete the Trial of the Sekimas, a grueling gauntlet that will test their strength, will, cunning, and patience. To enter, a warrior of the Maraketh must prove their worth by trapping the soul of a djinn in a coin, and you are no different. Once you have earned your coin, it may be placed on the Relic Altar to begin the trial. In the Trial of the Sekimas, each room has its own challenges to overcome. In this room, each rare monster you kill will send its blood to the chalice in the center of the room. Once the chalice is filled, you will be able to proceed. While fighting monsters in the trial, you will need to be very careful. 
Each hit will not only hurt you, but will damage your honor. The monsters are well telegraphed, so that you can avoid their attacks, but if you run out of honor, you will fail the trial and need to find another coin in order to try again. It is a good idea to make sure that you are well prepared before challenging the trial of the Secondus. After each room, you will be rewarded. In this case, you have been given a key that can be used to unlock chests later in the trial. Once you have claimed your reward, you will be shown a map of the rest of the floor and may choose how you wish to proceed. Which challenges would you like to face, and which rewards do you want to claim? Some rooms are more dangerous, afflicting you with debuffs that will persist for the entire trial. For example, entering this room will afflict you with Spiked Shell that will cause all monsters in the rest of the trial to have 50% increased life. You will want to take care if you choose such a path. There are many different challenges and rewards as you journey through the trial. Deadly traps, waves of monsters, and strange artifacts will test your honor. As you progress, you'll be able to gain boons from the Jinn, which will help you on your journey. For example, the Sekima's cloak will revive you once if you die, giving you a second shot at a run. One of the rewards you may find is Sacred Water, an extremely valuable and treasured resource to the Jinn and the Maraketh. Trading it with the Jinn will allow you to receive many benefits. You can recover honor, gain additional boons, or remove afflictions. At the end of the floor, you'll find a powerful boss which will truly test your limitations. In order to ascend, you will need to defeat him. Having defeated the boss, you've earned the right to ascend. But first, the loot. The keys you have found may be used to open the various treasures in the vault at the end of the floor. We only have a single bronze key, so we'll just have to open one of these small chests. If you want to open the better ones, you'll need silver or gold keys. Let's use the Altar of Ascendancy. Your first ascension will allow you to pick your class and grant you two points to use in the tree. Now there are more floors and many more rewards that can be found within the Trial of the Sekimus, but we'll save that for the section on the endgame. For now, let's talk about the second Ascendancy Trial. The Trial of Chaos. In Path of Exile 2, you can choose whichever trial you like to earn your ascension. Each culture on Rayclast had their own methods to ascend. If the Trial of the Sekimus is not your kind of playstyle, or you're finding it too difficult, you could try another. You can gain all your ascension points from just one, or mix and match them. It's up to you. For early access, we will have two trials as options, with a third trial coming later for the full release. While exploring the Val jungle, you'll discover the Temple of Chaos. Before the Val embraced the science of corruption, their civilization worshipped chaos. This ancient trial was once used by the Val to test their high priests. A high priest of the Val must show willingness to risk everything to gain power. Entry to the trial requires a token from a strange entity known only as the Trial Master. For those in which he sees potential, he shall inscribe an ultimatum. Many have attempted these trials in search of greatness. Most have perished. Will you be able to defy the odds? Before you begin each chamber, the Trial Master will offer you a reward and a choice. Choose one of three tribulations to affect you through the rest of the trial. These modifiers might beef up the monsters, curse the player, or add environmental hazards like turrets or trap runes. In this case, we will be picking shocking turrets. As you enter the room, the Trial Master will fill it with hazards to test your commitment. In this case, you must destroy all the monsters that fill the room, while dealing with the lightning projectiles from the shocking turrets. After each room, you will need to make a choice. Take the rewards you have earned so far, or go double or nothing. Increase your rewards, but take on more risk. Each tribulation you add is minor on its own, but they quickly stack on top of each other and can become overwhelming. There are many types of chambers in the trial. Each will test your resolve in different ways. This one simply requires you survive for a certain amount of time. Another requires you to escort the stone idol through the level as elevators full of monsters descend to attack you. 
Should you be able to get through the first three chambers, you will face your first boss. The order of the bosses is random, and combined with the tribulations you have selected, the fight will never feel the same. After defeating the boss, you may claim your rewards. Of course there are the items, but you also gain the right to ascend. If you already did the Trial of the Sekimas, then you can claim two more points to add to your Ascendancy class. Now it's possible to go much deeper. There are more bosses, rewards and risks to take, but we'll talk more about that when we get to Endgame. So how about we talk about that now? So far we've only been showing you footage from the campaign, but some people would argue that the Endgame is where the game truly begins. Something that happens almost every time a new action RPG launches is people saying, there isn't enough Endgame content. Well, we want to make sure that in POE 2, people don't feel that way. And we actually only changed our development priority for this recently. The first three acts of POE 2 already take around 25 hours to complete if you're a new player. This is already a pretty significant campaign. On the other hand, people spend hundreds of hours in Endgame each league. We realized that finishing the rest of the campaign for Early Access was actually a bad idea. Instead of having acts 4 to 6 in Early Access, we could concentrate on Endgame and make that great. For new players, a 25 hour campaign is already a huge game with lots of content, but for existing action RPG players, what you mostly care about is all the end game challenges to overcome. So several months ago, we switched the entire development team's focus over to making end game content. At the start of Early Access, there will be 50 bosses and around 400 monster types, but the great thing is that the rest of the game is like 80% there. We'll be adding content to roughly double the size of the game during Early Access and into release. Now in order to make the endgame happen at the same character level as what it would be after we added the rest of the acts, we've added a second difficulty level called Cruel, where you repeat the campaign with all the monsters and bosses leveled up. And of course new rewards. You can kind of think of it as like a new game plus. It's also a lot faster to get through the content the second time as your clear speed increases. That will take you to around level 65 where the endgame begins. Once we add the remaining three acts, we'll be removing Cruel difficulty, so you'll progress straight from the end of Act 6 to endgame. But what is the endgame? To explain that, I'll hand over to Mark. He can tell you all about it. Hi, I'm Mark Roberts, Game Director on Path of Exile 2. Well, one thing that Path of Exile is known for is having a lot of distinct endgame content to choose between. Each endgame mechanic needs to have its own progression system, areas, bosses, rewards, and player power that can only be gained from that content. We are going to be adding a lot more over time, but for Path of Exile 2 we decided to start with 7 distinct systems you can progress through. This is the Atlas, and it serves as the core of the endgame for Path of Exile 2. It's infinite and expands in all directions. Now we are not going to spoil the plot too much here, but corruption from the beast has blighted the land and your objective is to help fight it. In the center of the Atlas you will find the Ziggurat a temple in which the Val research the fundamentals of space and time. Here we can open portals to nearby locations and begin cleansing corruption and finding resources. In order to power the portal device we will need waystones. Each waystone has a tear which will determine the level of the monsters that you will face. To go to an area simply click one that is adjacent to an area that you have already completed. Insert the waystone and click traverse. Portals will open, allowing you and your party to travel to the area you have selected. All the areas in the endgame feel distinct from the locations in the campaign, and we have dialed the randomization up to 11. The monster packs you will face in each map are totally random, and the combination of them can lead to some very interesting combat situations. There are over 400 monster types in early access, and they have a lot of varied and interesting abilities. Depending on which combinations you face, you might find some serious challenges. In order to cleanse the corruption from the area, you will need to defeat all the powerful rare and unique enemies in it. Once you have done that, the area will be marked as completed and you will be able to travel past it to progress deeper into the world. If you die, then the map can no longer be run and you will have to find another way around to get to the areas behind it. There are also all kinds of other random encounters you might run into as you play maps. One such encounter are Precursor Artifacts. These are ancient, corrupting monuments that irradiate the monsters around them. The monsters that feed off the corruption are drawn to their power. If you defeat the monsters and cleanse the artifact, you will get a powerful temporary buff. Some of the buffs make you faster, others rain lightning or fire around you, and some even give you increased experience or help you find better items. You can also find strong boxes. These enigmatic chests guard piles of treasure. 
but are always a trap. Monsters lie in wait to attack you the moment you open it, and the boxes often have mechanisms to unleash powerful spells or dangerous debuffs. There are different types of strong boxes containing different items, and you can even use your currency items to craft them on the fly, so you can optimize the contents. But be careful of opening one you can't handle. Sometimes you'll discover monsters frozen in essences, solidified crystalline corruption. These dangerous monsters can be broken free. If you defeat them, the essence they drop can be used to upgrade normal items to magic items with a guaranteed mod from a category. For example, we could use this one on some boots to ensure a movement speed mod. Rarely, essences will also drop that allow you to upgrade magics to rares adding the guaranteed mod. This is incredibly powerful since it allows you to get a second deterministic mod in your crafting projects. Combining these with the currencies that are commonly found in Rayclast for modifying items, and we can get a very nice pair of boots indeed. Waystones, like all items, can also be crafted using your currency items. Adding prefix mods will improve the rewards, while suffix mods increase danger. The more dangerous a map is, the more waystones will drop. Adding mods to your waystones is key to progressing to higher tiers and sustaining them, but it will require you to take on larger challenges. There are a variety of factors you'll have to consider when crafting your waystones. Some maps will have higher density, some lower, some have more magic and rare chests, or monsters, some are more linear, and others more open. Make sure you explore and think about what makes certain maps good if you want to maximize your returns. As you cleanse corruption from higher and higher tiers of the Atlas, you will gain points that you can spend in the Atlas tree. This tree allows you to juice the danger and rewards of all areas in the endgame. You could increase the number of monsters, the number of rares, the number of precursor artifacts or strongboxes, even the quantity of item drops. As you explore the endgame world map, you'll notice various different biomes from snow-capped mountains to dense jungle valleys. Most maps are restricted to certain biomes. As you continue to explore deeper into the atlas, there are all sorts of things to discover. These cities are constructed by different peoples of Rayclast and have specific items that can be found there. These strange structures marked on the map don't appear to do anything for now. Perhaps you'll work out how to use them later. You might find unique maps like Untainted Paradise, an undisturbed island full of beasts that give an extreme amount of experience. You may even find a lonely man just enjoying his retirement who will give you a unique item for free. In addition, you can find special areas that would make a good spot to set up camp. Clear these areas of their hostile inhabitants and you'll be able to claim them as your own hideout. You can decorate your hideout as you see fit and invite various NPCs to join you there to create your own personal base of operations. A great tool for exploration are towers. These mysterious precursor constructs are dotted around the atlas. Completing the tower will reveal a large area around it, allowing you to scout out your next challenge. There are lots of things to find, so keep looking. Some sections of your atlas are influenced by corruption. This adds extra modifiers to the maps in the region, increasing difficulty and rewards. Here, slaying monsters in close proximity to each other will cause the vestiges of corruption within them to merge together, forming powerful and grotesque abominations. You may have noticed while looking at the atlas that some of the areas have these icons above them. The icon indicates that the area contains some kind of special encounter. This icon indicates that the area has a powerful boss. Because only one in four maps contain a map boss, we are able to make them very powerful and very rewarding. These bosses come from the campaign, but have had their difficulty increased with changes to AI and some of their abilities. It's worth noting that because you can see where the bosses are, you can choose to take them on or avoid them. If you do choose to hunt bosses though, then you will be rewarded with special points for the boss hunting section of the Atlas skill tree. The points here will allow you to specialize in boss killing, giving you much greater rewards for defeating them. 
For each different type of content in the endgame, we are adding specialized trees in order to make it so you don't feel the need to respec your points when you change between different types of content. We will be showing you seven of these by the end of this presentation, so there is still a lot more to come. Bosses are not the only icon you will see on the Atlas. Let's take a look at one of the endgame systems, Breach. If you played PoE 1, you might be familiar with Breach. For PoE 2, we have created sequels to several PoE 1 leagues. While the mechanic is familiar, the monsters, bosses, rewards, and progression are all new. A breach is a tear in the fabric of reality. Opening it will allow you to see the demons and otherworldly monstrosities that lie in wait on this other plane of existence. By engaging with a breach, you'll create a bridge between their world and Rayclast. In order to keep the breach open, you will need to kill the demons that pour forth. The faster you can kill the monsters, the more monsters you will fight, and the more loot you will find. You can also find clasped hands that will open and drop more items if you run over them. These can be a good boost to the rewards of the breach, so keep an eye out. One of the rewards that you may find while fighting monsters from breach are tablets. Tablets are special items that can be used with Precursor Towers to add more encounters to the Atlas. Breaches will drop Breach Tablets. Clicking on a completed tower will allow you to consume the tablet to add more breaches to areas within range of the tower. This makes all the content in the Atlas self-sustaining. Want to do more breaches? Find the tablets, add them to your towers, get more breaches, getting more tablets. Soon your Atlas will be covered in otherworldly domains. In addition, like all items in PoE, you can craft them. Use your currency to add mods to your tablets, allowing you to upgrade all the breaches in range. Tablets can have up to two mods. These mods do things like adding extra rare monsters, extra clasped hands, or even monster density of breaches, allowing you to keep them open longer. Often, you will find multiple towers near to each other with overlapping areas of effect. This can allow you to rarely juice the mechanic by stacking the mods from multiple tablets. In your fight to hold the Breach Demons at bay, you may want to use the powers of their world against them. Each endgame mechanic always has player power that can only be gained from that mechanic, and Breach is no different. In Breach, you will find Catalysts, items that can increase the quality of rings and amulets by improving specific mods. You can also find Breach Rings, a special base type that can have its quality improved by Catalysts up to 50%. In this case, you could create a ring with around 170 life. Breach rings can become some of the strongest rings in the game, giving you some good motivation to face the demon hordes. In addition, each endgame mechanic needs to have a pinnacle endgame encounter. While killing breach monsters, you may find breach splinters. Collect enough of these and you'll be able to create a breach stone. Using a vile technology called the Realm Gate, you can use your breach stone to access their domain and bring the fight to them. In this twisted domain, you will find nothing but a single massive breach. Triggering it will reveal hordes of Breach inhabitants. And should you be fast enough, you will be able to fight their leader, Zesht. We that are one. We that dreamed. We in Nightmare. We that are one. This is just one of the pinnacle encounters of PoE 2. We won't be showing the rest of them, so you will have to discover them for yourself. But rest assured, this is some of the hardest content we have ever made. All of these encounters have specific uniques that can only be found from them, but that's not all. We still have the progression system. Defeating Zesht will give you points to allocate into the Breach section of the Atlas Tree. Allocating these points will make Breaches and the Breach Domain even harder, but will give you more rewards. The small nodes will increase the difficulty of the Twisted Domain, while the large nodes have more specific bonuses. For example, this node adds more clasped hands to your Breaches, and adds a pack of magic monsters that can guard them. Get some more points and you can allocate Waking Nightmare which will double the number of splinters you get from clasped hands and inflict you with a mysterious debuff. In order to earn more points, you will need to defeat Zesht at a higher difficulty and some rewards from Zesht can only be found by increasing the difficulty of the Twisted Domain above certain thresholds. 
Defeating Sesht at difficulty 4 will be a challenge indeed, but there are many more threats in Rayclast. Ritual altars are sacrificial sites built by the mysterious King in the Mists. If you encounter this symbol on the atlas, then you know that the area contains ritual altars. Ritual altars demand tribute. Every monster you slaughter in the circle will feed the altar. After the sacrifice, touch it to begin the ritual. The monsters you just killed will be resurrected by the King of the Mists' dark magic, and you must fight to survive. The tribute you have offered to the altar can be spent to buy powerful items, but they can be expensive. To gain more tribute, you will want to find more altars. Each successive ritual you do within an area will spawn the monsters revived by the previous ones, in addition to the ones you sacrifice next to it. By the end of an area, you will be fighting a truly imposing number of foes, but will have a significant amount of tribute to spend. One of the rewards you can buy with tribute are omens. These are special items that allow for metacrafting. Crafting items that affect other crafting items. Have an item with good prefixes but bad suffixes? This omen will help you to remove the mod you don't want while keeping the ones you do. There are a bunch more of these with different effects, but we will leave them for you to discover. Now don't forget that Ritual will also drop tablets, which can be used to specialize into getting more Rituals. If you want to get to the pinnacle boss of Ritual, then you will probably want to use them. They can also be crafted to grant mods, making your Rituals more rewarding. The pinnacle encounter of Ritual is the King in the Mists. Feared by the Asmeri people, he is said to have brought eternal darkness to the Wildwood. We won't show the encounter, but just like Breach, there are a range of unique items you can get for defeating him, and you will gain points in the ritual section of the Atlas Tree. Some maps have been touched by insanity. A mysterious entity has taken a special interest in you. Step through the looking glass and you will find your nightmares coming to life. When you touch a mirror, the mists of delirium will spread out across the area, infecting your mind. You must stay within the mist to maintain the nightmare, which is as profitable as it is terrifying. Everything you kill will increase the rewards that drop. However, the deeper into the mist you travel, the stronger the monsters are. Be careful not to overstay your welcome. Rare and unique enemies will become vessels for terrifying demons, who will manifest out of them to unleash powerful attacks on you. The mist also offers a strange crafting material, distilled emotions. By combining these emotions, you are able to instill your amulet with a notable from the passive skill tree. This is like gaining an extra passive point for free, attached to your gear. They are also particularly great because you don't have to traverse the tree to get them, allowing you to get off-class bonuses that would normally be much harder to get. Distilled emotions can also be used to instill your endgame maps, applying Delirious to them and adding additional difficulty and rewards, allowing you to further juice your endgame maps. The tablets you can find from Delirium can be used to further improve it, increase pack size, make the fog dissipate slower, or improve your progress towards the pinnacle encounter of Delirium. Speaking of which, every now and then you will find Simulacrum Splinters. The mysterious entity will create strange encounters based on warped versions of your own memories. Monsters and Simulacrums come in waves that get progressively more difficult. You will receive loot at the end of each wave and you will have to make the decision to leave now or continue on, facing up against even tougher foes from the mist. The bosses you will face as you get deeper into a Simulacrum are truly terrifying. If you can complete a simulacrum, you will gain points for the delirium section of the atlas skill tree. Next up we have Expedition. Occasionally while clearing corruption, you will encounter these Kalgurin settlers. The Kalgurins have discovered ancient burial sites with lost Verisium artifacts, and they want you to help dig them up with explosives. The Kalgurins have marked the locations where the relics can be found. Place explosives as best you can to dig up as many as possible. There is just one problem. Corruption has brought the corpses of their ancestors to life, so you might have to do a little cleanup before you can reclaim the artifacts. You can also find remnants, the destruction of which will further anger the restless dead. Each one you blow up will make the subsequent monsters more powerful, but also more rewarding. Danig, Rog, Tujin, and Gwenin will exchange the artifacts for useful items and runic magic. You can also find tablets to increase the number of expeditions and the rewards. This one increases the radius of explosives, while this one increases the number of remnants you will find. 
Eventually, you might discover a logbook. These are special maps full of buried treasure and relics. Essentially, one giant dig site. Here, you can create an extremely long chain of explosives and go through a very high number of remnants. But be careful. Many remnants have mods that can rarely break your build, so you will probably want to avoid these ones. If you add too many remnants, you could easily make the encounter harder than you can handle. There are all sorts of interesting things buried under the ground in logbooks. You might find dripping caves and hidden pirate caches. But the most powerful encounter is Ulroth, the ancient undead commander of the Knights of the Sun. Defeating him will grant you unique rewards, as well as points to spend in the expedition section of the Atlas Tree. So those are the in-game systems on the Atlas, but we are not done yet. The trials we talked about earlier have much more content when you get to Endgame 2. Just like the other in-game systems, they also have progression mechanics, unique rewards, and player power that can only be gained from them. As you get higher level coins for the trial of the Sycamers, you will unlock more floors to explore. Each floor has its own challenging rooms and a floor boss that you will need to kill. There are four floors in total, leading to another pinnacle boss at the end of the last floor, which can only be accessed at end game. The trial of the Sycamers is where you'll find jewels, which you can socket into your tree. These are like passives that you can craft with your currency items. They can be really powerful as they allow you to stack modifiers that may not be easily accessible on the tree normally. This jewel gives lightning damage and shock chance for example. There are quite a few jewel sockets on the tree, so it's possible to gain a lot of power here. There are also other types of jewels that don't provide any bonuses themselves, but affect other passives surrounding them. This jewel increases the effect of small nodes and radius by 25%. With careful placement in the tree, you could get a significant amount of power from it. There are also unique jewels available with very interesting effects, but you will have to find those for yourself. In order to push further into the trial and uncover the secrets of the Marraketh, you will want to take advantage of its progression system, relics. Relics are items that can be placed in the relic altar as you start the trial. They give special bonuses that affect the trial, making it easier and increasing its rewards. Of course, you can craft these with your currency items, making them even stronger. If you can complete the entire trial overcoming all four floors, the final boss will reward you with one of many unique relics. These relics will be consumed when used on your next run, but can reward you with unique and powerful items. For example, this is the Last Flame. If you use it, you will have only one honor for the entire trial, so you will need to do a completely hitless run. The Trial of Chaos also extends into the endgame. As you gain inscribed ultimatums of higher and higher levels, the number of chambers that you can go through increases. In true Val style, this allows you to take even more risks for even more rewards. At endgame, you can progress through up to 10 chambers with 3 bosses on a single run. Stacking 10 tribulations on top of each other will make this a significant challenge, but it's worth it. The Trial Master will tempt you with items of the Val Empire, such as Val Orbs. Val Orbs are powerful crafting items that corrupt your gear with random mysterious outcomes. Corruption prevents an item from being modified further, so it has to be the last step of your craft. But it's also the most impactful one. For example, if you use one on your body armor, it might add a new powerful enchantment, or it might re-roll up to half of its modifiers. Val Orbs also have the ability to add a socket, allowing you to bypass the normal restriction of how many sockets an item can have. A body armor could get up to three sockets this way, allowing for a significant number of mods. Val Orbs can even modify uniques. Adding enchantments or sockets to uniques can make them incredibly powerful, but there is a good chance that you will break them as well. The Trial Master will also occasionally offer you soul cores. Originally formed by Chaos, the Val sought to replicate soul cores through human sacrifice rituals and blood magic to power their civilization. Soul cores are powerful socketable items, with mods that cannot be obtained from regular runes. Like all in-game content, there is of course a pinnacle boss. The final chamber will drop keys to this mysterious door. Some say this is where the Trial Master himself resides. Perhaps you are willing to take the risk to find out. Had enough yet? Because there is still just one more thing. The most difficult content in Path of Exile 2. 
While mapping, you might come across this fortress that has emerged from underground, surrounded by an enormous maze riddled with danger. Is the maze preventing something from getting in or something getting out? This fortress is of ancient origin and its construction has similarities to the towers and tablets that you have been using on your journey through the endgame. It is clear from the entrance that there are three keys required to enter. Local factions are vying for access to the fortress in order to seize the power they believe will be inside. Each of the faction's leaders have managed to get their hands on one of the keys, so you will need to defeat them. Each faction is led by an uber act boss. You can see one of them inhabiting the city, but in order to fight him, you will first need to defeat their two lieutenants in the adjacent zones. Be careful, if you fail against either of the lieutenants, or to kill the leader, they will move on, and you will need to find them again. Kill all the uber bosses and you will gain access to the fortress. We aren't going to spoil it as we can't wait to see you guys attempt it for the first time. But is there a tree you get points in after killing it? Of course there is. This is Path of Exile, there is always another tree. So these are your challenges for Peewee 2. As you can see, this project is crazy huge. Way bigger than even we expected when we started out. But how do you gain access? Well, during early access you'll need a key to get in. To thank our existing Peewee supporters who have spent more than 480 US dollars, we'll be giving you guys a key for the PC version for free. Anyone else who wants one can get one by purchasing one of the new early access supporter packs that have just been released to the store. If you just want early access to Peewee 2, then you can get a key in the 30 US dollar early access pack. The pack also comes with $30 of points to spend in the MTX store. But we also have a variety of other supporter packs filled with exclusive microtransactions, points to spend in the store, and even physical items. The cosmetics can be used right now in Peewee 1 and in Path of Exile 2 when early access starts. Most of this footage has been recorded in Path of Exile 1, since that's where you can use them immediately. The Lord of Ogham supporter pack contains a cosmetic armor set befitting of the Count of Ogham himself. There is also a matching back attachment which has an alternate variant depicting the influence of corruption. Also in this pack you can find a portal formed of the rusted armor of the fallen soldiers in the Red Vale of Ogham, and the offspring of a vicious crowbell boss found in the hunting grounds. This one doesn't look so vicious though. On top of that, you'll receive the Iron Count's Zweihander to apply to your one-handed or two-handed swords. For those who are wanting to decorate your hideouts with fond memories and tales of Path of Exile's history, you will also get a series of hideout statues. This pack contains the statue of Hillock. For Path of Exile 1's closed beta, each pack contained a true New Zealand icon, the Kiwi. Following this tradition, all packs in this series will also contain a new themed Kiwi pet. The pet will loyally follow you into battle, but run away at the first sign of trouble. Become the ruler of the desert with the King of the Faradun supporter pack. Show your mastery of traversing the sands of the Vasteri Plains. The body armor will allow you to glide along the ground with ancient sand magic. Now each armor set comes with body armor, boots, gloves and helmet. But the boots are covered in sand. If you'd prefer to show them off, you can turn the gliding off if you want. The accompanying back attachment equips you with two powerful pillars that can control and manipulate lightning. They will periodically release their energy in a powerful blast while in town, and hover in a circle around you, arcing lightning between them forming a barrier of energy. Replace the appearance of any bow with the Faradun's glory skin. Or replace the appearance of a spear with the Tyranny's end spear skin. This spear skin can be applied to staves and war staves in Path of Exile 1. If you want to truly show your worth as a King of the Faradun, then you definitely need your trusty, moving, entire city fortress known as the Dreadnought to travel across the Vasteri Plains. In Path of Exile you can decorate your hideout however you like, and it's no exception here. It comes with a variety of thematic elements to use, or use decorations from elsewhere in the game. Additionally, you will get the Deshret's Blessing Level Up effect. The King of the Faradun Kiwi Pet, and last but not least, a statue depicting the Vile Oversoul from Path of Exile 1. For those who don't know how supporter packs work, each pack comes with all of the cosmetics from the previous tier, so you'll get all the items from the Lord of Ogham supporter pack as well. The Thaumaturge of the Vile supporter pack features an armor set and back attachment themed around the Vile and their pursuit of science and progress. You can find the Soul Core weapon effect in this pack which causes thaumaturgic energy harnessed from sacrifice to spill from your weapon. This pack also contains Doyani's Idol, 
It replaces the default appearance of any foci to an ancient relic once used by Doyani, and this can be applied to shields in Path of Exile 1. That's not the only Vile weapon you'll find. It also contains the Wand of the Thaumaturge skin, and the Royal Sacrifice Dagger skin. You wouldn't think to put sacrificial gems on a Kiwi, but the Vile did. Thaumaturge of the Vile supporters will receive the Thaumaturge of the Vile Kiwi pet, and the Statue of Dominus. This is also the first pack in the series with a physical item. When purchasing this pack, you'll receive a Path of Exile 2 logo t-shirt. But if you don't want one, you can opt out and return for additional points to spend in the store. Becoming a Warlord of the Karui supporter will grant you an armor set and back attachment, adorned in jade carvings and iridescent feathers resembling power. Enough to even impress the ancestral gods, specifically Tukuhama, the Karui god of war. Overkill, you say? I think the Karui people would disagree. Why not drop a gigantic totem on rare enemies you slay to crush them to a pulp? Replace your crafting bench in your hideout with the Ancestral Canoe Crafting Bench, where Ancestral Chief Mata will summon a giant canoe manned by Karui warriors to aid in your crafting desires. We must all start somewhere. You'll also get a pair of weapon skins. Equip Akoya's Felling Axe skin to your one-hand or two-handed axes, or Tukohama's Crusher to your one-handed or two-handed maces. A true Karui Warlord is always accompanied by their trusty Kiwi. Equipped with armor and harnessing ancestral magic, they make the perfect sidekick. Once one of the most feared beings in Rayclast, Malachi was slain by a powerful exile. May the statue commemorate the virtue of exile's past, present and of the future. Of course, it's not all about dressing up in-game. You'll want to look good in real life too. By becoming a Warlord of the Kurui supporter, you'll also get a Path of Exile 2 hoodie. Our final tier of supporter pack in this series is the Liberator of Rayclass supporter pack. The Liberator of Rayclass armor set and back attachment come made with the finest materials in Rayclass and shattered glass mosaics suspended in divine power. Set up your base of operations in the Beacon of Salvation hideout. Why restrict yourself to just one island when you can liberate more? The Beacon of Salvation hideout comes equipped with your own collection of small islands and personal operators of boats that you can use to row between them. Just walk to the piers, click a boat to enter and navigate as you choose. Decorate each island as you see fit to best represent your well-earned hideout. Everyone in your hideout can use their own boat. Why not have some races? You can also get the Window to Twilight portal effect. A beautiful mosaic piece of art that shatters and reveals a gateway to your desired destination as you approach it. As you walk away, the glass magically reforms back to its original form. Rule in style with the Throne of the Ruler map device. Sure, this map device can create portals to in-game maps, but it also comes with a throne you can sit on to oversee your growing kingdom. Look down on the plebeians running your maps. Being the Liberator though is not just about sitting on your throne all day. If you do decide to join the fight yourself, you can leave a High Priest in charge as your second in command. Liberator of Rayclass supporters will also get a set of varied weapon skins. The Light of Divinity Scepter skin, the Deliverance Crossbow Skin, the Justice Flail Skin, and the Redemption Shield Skin. Once again, you'll have an accompanying Kiwi, and of course a statue depicting one of the most iconic events in Rayclast's history. The battle between a powerful exile and Kitava, the Insatiable. With the help of two deities, Sin and Innocence, the exile was able to defeat him once and for all. This supporter pack also contains the Path of Exile 2 art book. This 215-page full-color art book includes a huge amount of amazing concept art and lore produced during the long and exciting journey of Path of Exile 2's development. And finally, Path of Exile has a tradition of letting the community participate in designing game features. For Path of Exile 2, we'll be adding the Twilight Order Foil Reliquary. By becoming a Liberator of Rayclass supporter, once Path of Exile 2 is released, you will be able to select any unique item you have found and be able to drop it from the Reliquary. Once players have submitted their items, keys to the Reliquary will start dropping, and other players will be able to find foil versions of uniques that you have submitted along with a message for the lucky player. The more players submit the same unique, the more chances there will be for the Reliquary to drop them, so choose wisely. Now almost all of these items are available to use in POE 1 right now. There are a few exceptions where the item class clearly doesn't exist, such as crossbows or flails. 
and there are also a few microtransactions on weapon types that are unavailable in POE2 at the start of Early Access. Once classes that use those weapon types are added, those microtransactions will be available to use. If you can't decide which supporter pack to choose yet, you can always start with the Early Access supporter pack that just includes a key and some points to spend in the store. Then you can upgrade to any of the following tiers at a later date. These supporter packs will be available for purchase throughout Early Access. We would really like to thank you for your ongoing support. Without you guys, Path of Exile 2 could not have happened. Now, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Stick around, because coming up next, we have a live Q&A with Ziggy D. Sir? Then brothers and sisters of the crib, that's been the the Path of Exile 2 endgame content reveal. <laughs> Needless to say, we are in for a treat. We're gonna be eating good. Hey, can you imagine? It's a free game, baby. All right, then brothers and sisters of the crib. Till next time. Peace.